I gather you all up with uh, We have a video to show you that will give you kind of a taste of what took place at camp this past week with our discovery with our discovery campers. So if we're ready for that, we'll begin the video.
Amen. Praise God for another great week. And I'll tell you, if you've never seen camp in action, there really is nothing like it. I want to encourage you uh, to make your way up there this week if you haven't already this season. And what's really cool is that Adventure Camp starts today uh, at 3 p.m. So please be in prayer for the campers, for the volunteers, for everyone who will be involved in the ministry this week. Uh, you can join us for a couple of different things. Vespers, uh, the Vesper services are at 7 p.m. every evening, Sunday through Thursday. You can join us for any meal, breakfast, lunch, or dinner, uh, with a suggested donation of $2 for our church family. That is the cheapest meal around. It's really important, if you are going to join us for a meal, please let us know ahead of time by calling 716-676-2148. Let the kitchen staff know that you'll be coming uh, so we know how much food to prepare. One of the ways that we keep costs down to keep camp affordable is we don't prepare a whole lot more food than we need to. But we want to feed you. Just let us know that you're on your way. Staff doings is this Saturday, the 27th, 5 p.m. at the Grove in Yorkshire. Uh, please sign up in the back or you can see Mrs. Ellen Hatch for more information. That's this Saturday, the 27th, 5 p.m. at the Grove. Uh, kind of wrap up and celebrate the camp season there. Camp Celebration Sunday is this coming Sunday, July 28th. Service will be at 10 a.m. at Camp JYC. I'm sorry that we haven't given you more heads up on that. That's going to be this coming Sunday, 28th, at camp. I'll send out an email to remind you, but if you come here, no one will be here. Uh, it'll be up at camp in the lodge. Uh, this really, really cool Sunday that we do once a year. Uh, you can stick around afterwards for a picnic lunch and then just enjoy the property. Check out the pool, the pond, the sports facilities. Should be a great, great afternoon. Uh, I am on vacation. My wife and I will be gone from August 5th through August 9th. That's what Kara tells me. <laughs> so that's what I'm going with. Vacation means no working. Vacation means no working. You can reach out to the elders during that time if you need anything, and then I'll be back on the 9th. If you are not on our email list, you don't get emails from the church, whether it's updates or prayer requests, if you would like to be on our email list, please fill out a welcome card or reach out to Cassie at franklinvillefbc at gmail.com. We don't blow up your inbox with things, uh, but occasionally we'll send out important reminders and updates and certainly prayer requests. So if you want to be a part of that, just let one of us know and get us your contact info. And this being the third Sunday of the month, I'm really excited that this is our Missions Highlight Sunday. So we should have a picture for our missions family. Where will we go today? On a map, you look at Maine, swing out over the Atlantic, and you'll see an island that is St. John's, Newfoundland, where the little community of Kilbride is located. What's going on in Kilbride? This is where missionaries Matt and Ruth Leahy planted a church in 2021. Now, anytime a church is planted and it takes root, that's something to be thankful for. But this place is special because before the Leahy's planted Kilbride Community Church, there had not been an evangelical church there since, oh, excuse me, in 132 years. There had not been an evangelical church for 132 years. Talk about a mission field. Matt and Ruth Leahy. They first tried a Bible study, and in the first seven weeks, they had one person attend. During the COVID-19 days, they did a lot of publicity and slowly people came and the church began to grow. People up there think of church as a building rather than a body of Christ and growing a strong church in any area like that will take time. So please be in prayer for Matt and Ruth Leahy and the community of Kilbride and Kilbride Community Church. I'd like to invite up Brother Al who's gonna lead us in the call to worship this morning. Good morning, everyone. My joy to do this every Sunday morning. And today, instead of me reading to you, I invite you to stand and we'll read it all together on the screen. In Isaiah 
chapter 40, verses 28 through 31. Have you not known, have you heard, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youth shall faint and not be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you this morning for the privilege to call you our Father. Thank you for rescuing each and every one of us from that slave market of sin. Thank you, Lord, for being an active, integral part of our daily life, strengthening us when we're weak, lifting us up when we are down, encouraging us to continue walk with you. We thank you this morning for the camp ministry and how I remember almost 70 years ago I began this walk with you in a camp setting. How important it is to reach young lives for you. We ask your blessing on those that labor. Lord, do I know from my own experience how tiring it can be at the end of the week. Strengthen each one. May they mount up with wings like eagles. Encourage us and give us enthusiasm to oil the machinery that has to run every day at camp. We ask your blessing on each of the new campers as they show up this afternoon and give them open ears and attentive hearts to the message of your word. And now we ask, Lord, your blessing on our time of praise and worship and our time of study from your word. May it encourage us to praise you more in the days ahead. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you turn and greet your neighbor this morning?
Lord, we know that name is above every name. Mm. The only one on which we can call for salvation. Amen. Thank you for meeting us here this morning, Lord. In our reading of the word, our singing, and now the proclaiming of the word. Ask that we would hear it, receive it well. Strengthen Pastor Marcus' house. In Jesus' name. Good morning. Good morning. Turn your Bibles, please, to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 10 through 15. And while you're turning there, I want to share a prayer request with you, and I, I hope that you'll uh, consider this this week. The First Baptist Church of Dallas, Texas, had a catastrophic fire over the weekend, and their sanctuary burned to the ground. No one was hurt, praise God, but... Uh, they lost a beautiful and historic piece of property that they had gathered in for, goodness, over 150 years, I believe. Uh, and from where they're located in downtown Dallas had been a major hub where they'd reached people with the gospel and really expanded their ministry. So be in prayer for them. Obviously, we know that the church isn't a building, but to lose something that significant is tough. I know they're gathering to meet for worship this morning somewhere else in Dallas off the property, but it's going to be a difficult few weeks and months for them. So please be in prayer for the First Baptist Church of Dallas. Another thing that I had wanted to announce uh, that I forgot to <clears throat> when I was up here a few minutes ago is we are offering baptisms this Camp Sunday in the pool at camp. I know we did this recently, but if you've received Jesus as your Lord and Savior and you've never been baptized, we would love to baptize you. Please come and see me. Uh, baptism is a public step of obedience to proclaim to the world that you are a believer in Jesus, that you've been raised to a new life with him. So if you've never taken that, I want to encourage you to come and see me. We'd love to baptize you this Sunday uh, right in the pool of camp, which is a really, really cool and unique opportunity. Now, we're in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, and we're looking at verses 10 through 15 this morning. And this passage wraps up a major section of the letter of 2 Thessalonians. In fact, if you're looking ahead, you'll see that all that's left in the whole letter is just the benediction. Paul is just basically going to say goodbye to them after this, verses 16 through 18. Uh, it's highly possible that he wrote to them again after this, but we don't know that for sure. If he did, it's not considered Holy Scripture. As far as we know, we just have the letters of 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. But look with me here into today's passage, beginning with verse 10, please. For even when we were with you, we, gave, we would give you this command, if anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. For we hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busy bodies. Now such persons we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. As for you, brothers, do not grow weary in doing good. And if anyone does not obey what we say in this letter, take note of that person and have nothing to do with him that he may be ashamed. Do not regard him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. Let's open with a word of prayer. Father God, we come before you this morning knowing that we have nothing to offer you. Anything that's good about us comes directly from you and is a result of your grace and your love. We ask that you fill our hearts with your word. We ask that you would direct our lives. Please humble us, Lord. Please use your word to convict us correct us, and instruct us. We love you, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. One of the things I love about the Bible is how practical so much of it is. These verses deal plainly. Verses 10 through 15 deal plainly with something that all of us experience all the time. All of us is called to some area of work, whether you're called to a career in the workplace or you're called to working in the home or you're called to give of yourself and volunteer service. All of us are called to some area of work that God wants us to complete. This passage, and so many others like it, tell us of our responsibilities in the routines of everyday life. Now, there's a lot of lofty stuff in First and Second Thessalonians. There's instruction about the return of the Lord Jesus. There's instruction about the day of the Lord. There's instruction about the Antichrist. 
but there's a lot of material in here that is just really, really simple and practical, and we find that here. And we need to realize the ability that we have to glorify God in our work. Now, we saw last week that what the Bible teaches about work and labor is so vastly different from what the culture teaches about it. In the culture, you minimize work as much as you can. You get there as late as you can. You leave as early as you can. Work is just something you do to make ends meet. Work is something you do so you have money to do the things you'd rather be doing. But the Bible says, no, work is good. It's commanded by God. It's some way that you're going to bring glory to God, and he's commanded us to do it, and it's a positive thing. And Paul is really continuing that same line of thought here right up through verse 15. I see three main commands that we can pull from this passage. Here's the first one. Believers must not become a burden to others unnecessarily. Believers must not become a burden to others unnecessarily. Now in this morning's passage, you'll see that Paul is continuing the instruction that he delivered in verses 6 through 9, which we took a look at last week in depth. He's extrapolating on that, beginning in verse 10. Now as we study our passage today, and especially as we look at verse 10, I want you to compare in your mind what you hear from God's word, and what you hear from the culture. I want you to just keep these things in mind. Look with me at verse 10 here, 2 Thessalonians 3. For even when we were with you, we would give you this command. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. Could this be more straightforward? Could this be more clear for us? If anyone's not willing to work, let him not eat. Now, there were individuals... Or there were families in the Thessalonian church who had refused to work, and they refused to make themselves productive in any meaningful way. Maybe they thought they were in the day of the Lord, and so what's the point of working? Maybe they thought work was beneath them, and the reason that we have slaves is for them to do our work. Maybe they, they were just outright lazy, but for whatever reason, they were unwilling to work. Now, Paul doesn't tell us why they were unwilling to work, because guess what? It doesn't matter. Whatever reason they would give you, it's not valid. It's not material. Remember, work is commanded by God. And we also saw last week, work is not a result of the fall. Many people think that work entered the world when sin entered the world. That's not what happened. Sin cursed work. Work existed in the Garden of Eden. God gave the Adam and Eve commands to follow out, told them to tend the garden, to keep the land. What sin did to work is it made it miserable. It made it a source of suffering, but it has always been around. Now, with the idle Christians in the Thessalonian church, their problem was not one of ignorance. What do I mean by that? They couldn't claim ignorance as to what Paul was saying. Why not? Because we see here, when he was with them, he taught them these things. Not only did he teach them these things, he modeled for them what it looked like. Then when he wrote to them the first time, he reiterated these instructions. You've got to find a way to work. Now he's writing to them a third time about it. They cannot claim ignorance. Their problem was also not one of inability. He's only writing to able-bodied Christian adults who refuse to work. This isn't about children. It's not about the elderly. It's not about the disabled. It's not about those who are unable to work. This is about adult Christians who are able to work and refuse to work. They can't claim in ignorance. They can't claim inability. They also cannot claim a lack of opportunity. Why do I say that? There was so much work to be done. The work surrounded them. There was more work than there were workers. They, they were aware of this. They were just choosing not to do it. And Paul is reiterating here, this is unacceptable. And he's doing everything he can to get them to be productive. Now, he throws in this motivation. This is an added layer of motivation. If you won't work, you're not going to eat. You don't want to starve to death, right? So you have to find a way to work. This is simple motivation. It is, it's all about survival. Survival is really powerful. You'll find when people are genuinely in some kind of danger, they find this other gear that they didn't know existed, and they find a way to resolve the situation. He says, if you don't want to starve to death, I, find, I, I highly suggest that you make yourself productive or you're not going to eat, right? Now, this may seem kind of shocking to us in the United States in 2024. Why? Because how does our society seem to function? Our society tells people, you're not held to any kind of a standard. I'm talking about adults here specifically, not children. That our society tells people, you can eat as much as you want, 
Regardless of whether you're willing to work, our society will take healthy, able-bodied adults and will say to them, we don't expect you to work, we will support you and we will provide for all your needs and we will keep supporting you for as long as you want without holding you accountable at all. How far has our society moved away from this command? How clearly do you see this now? The government will take care of you from the cradle to the grave with every kind of program that you could ever possibly imagine. We enable people to be lazy. We enable people to be disobedient to the Lord. This is one of the elements of socialism. And I want to tell you this, no society, no culture, no nation has successfully functioned that way long term. Any assistance, any program that's offered should be aimed at getting people back on their feet should be aimed at getting people self-sufficient, should not be aimed at taking care of you for your entire life. Because if a society allows for people to eat without working, what's going to happen? People will continue to eat without working, many of them, and the, everyone else will have to pick up the slack. Almost every culture realizes the truth of Paul's command here in verse 10. What do I mean by that? Christian or not, Jewish or not, you see in cultures all over the world that they have this same kind of rule. If you won't work, you won't eat. Even cultures that have nothing in common with Christianity. Most of them organize themselves around this. It's how our lives should be organized. It's how our churches should be organized. It's how our society should be organized. Look with me as we see this wisdom expressed in Proverbs 6, verses 6 through 9 here. Look to the ant, you sluggard, and consider her ways and be wise. Without having any chief, officer, or ruler, she prepares her bread in the summer and gathers her food in harvest. How long will you lie there, O sluggard, and when will you arise from your sleep? Right? He says you can look, you can learn a lot of things by looking at how ants operate. No chief, no officer, no ruler. She's diligent. She plans ahead. She works hard. She makes sure that she has something to eat when she goes to harvest her food. Now I share this with you because it's important that we understand. The church has a lot of responsibilities to people. We do. We have responsibilities to people inside the church. We have responsibilities to people outside the church. But one responsibility that we do not have is we're not responsible for supporting able-bodied people who don't want to work long term. That is not something that the church is responsible for. In fact, if we were to do that, we'd be going against God's word. The church's responsibility is to help you get back on your feet, help your family get back on your feet, get you back to a point where you can support yourself not enable a person who wants to be lazy. God's word says here, let them feel the heat. Let them get a little hungry, then they'll be willing to work. Again, this isn't about disabled people or ill people. Support them as much as you can for as long as they need. This is about people who just don't want to work. I want to give you one final comment on this before we move on in the passage. We need to understand that God's word and socialism are diametrically opposed to one another. What do I mean by that? Christianity and socialism cannot be reconciled with one another. I know that socialism is really popular now. I know it's especially popular among young people, but it is just as unbiblical as it has ever been. And the proof is in the pudding on this one. What do I mean by this? Every socialist or communist leader is an atheist. Every one of them is an atheist. And every communist government persecutes Christians shuts down churches, sometimes they persecute Christians to the point of death. I'll give you some examples. Look at the former Soviet Union. You couldn't be a Christian in the former Soviet Union. Look at Cuba under Castro. Look at communist China today. All of these places, it's radically unsafe to become a Christian. Why is this? Because these communist leaders know that the message of Christ goes against their agenda, so they try to stamp out Christianity. You can think back to history class, there was a time when the United States actually experimented with a form of communism. It didn't work. When the pilgrims arrived, the New World in 1620, they arrived here with the vision of everyone owning everything communally and everyone working all the property in a communal way and everyone sharing the results. They saw everything as a really large community garden, essentially. But the idea failed. They, no one worked the fields because no one had any motivation to work the fields. Over the first few years after they arrived here, half the colony died. Many of them died in starvation. And the only way that they turned this around was because their governor, William Bradford, said, look, here's how we're going to do it now. Each of you, each family, is going to get a parcel of land that you will own. 
and you will work that parcel of land, you'll be responsible for it, and you will eat whatever you harvest. And it turned the colony around and set them on a completely different trajectory. They went from having no food and starving to death to having an abundance of food. They were harvesting, uh, they, they were tilling the fields, they were planting, they were harvesting, the harvest was bountiful, and why do we celebrate Thanksgiving today? The very first Thanksgiving really was about that successful harvest with private ownership. Because socialism, communism, they don't work, and they go against God's word. Now we talk about being, not being an unnecessary burden to one another. I want to draw you back to Paul's ministry as an example. We saw this a bit in last week's message. Wherever Paul went, and whoever he ministered to, it was a priority for him that he was not a financial burden on those people, whoever it was. Remember that he had every demand, every right, to make financial demands of these churches because he was working on their behalf. But he never made these demands. He never placed a burden on them. Look at 2 Corinthians 11, verses 7 through 9, please, and we see this revealed to us. Did I commit a sin, he's writing to the Corinthian church, did I commit a sin in humbling myself so that you might be exalted because I preached God's gospel to you free of charge? I robbed other churches by accepting support from them in order to serve you. And when I was with you and I was in need, I did not burden anyone. For the brothers who came from Macedonia supplied my need, so I refrained and will refrain from burdening you in any way. We should not be an unnecessary burden to our fellow believers. Now, again, if, you're, if you can't work because you can't work, you're not a burden to anyone. Any Christian in their right mind would do anything they could to help you. But if you're not working just because you don't want to be, Scripture would say that is wrong. Here's the second thing. Believers must not meddle in each other's lives. Believers must not meddle in each other's lives. We see that in this passage too, don't we? Now we saw last week that Paul identified this as a sin in the lives of some within the Thessalonian church, some of them. Instead of giving their time to useful, productive, decent things, they were spending their time meddling in other people's lives. Instead of working, they were gossiping, they were ordering people around, they were just being uh, a little too involved and a little too interested in the lives of others. And here's the reality. If you don't keep yourself occupied with good, wholesome things, if you don't fill your time with stuff that is really, really good, you will instead fill your time with stuff that we're not supposed to do. Now, meddling in others' lives is a sin. And it's problematic because this is a sin that our culture really, really approves of and really celebrates, right? You open any tabloid magazine that you see at the store and it's just pages and pages and pages of gossip. Oh, so-and-so is spotted holding hands with so-and-so and, and uh, oh, their kid, whatever, wearing whatever. <laughs> It's something that our culture is like really big on. Their entire industry is built around this. Turn on the radio, turn on the TV, you see, right, social media, all over the place. And I was regretful that I think it's something that the church really approves of as well, and the church engages in it. And I say, in some ways, the gossip that's passed around in churches is much more harmful than the gossip that's passed around in the unsaved world. It's also less natural because you expect it from the unsaved world, but we shouldn't come to expect it from Christians. But I would bet you... Almost everyone who's ever been in a church can probably tell you some way that their life was impacted by gossip. Either someone shared a piece of gossip with you, or you were gossiped about, or you were tempted to pass on some gossip yourself. Lots of times, what do we do? We spread stories. We don't even know if they're true. We don't even think of the impact that it has on the person who's being subjected to it. But here's where the rubber meets the road. Here's where I want to challenge you guys. Something can be true and still be gossip. Just saying that it's true doesn't make it not gossip. Something could be true and still be really, really harmful to the person it's being said about, right? For example, scripture says that love covers a multitude of sins. Well, what does gossip do? Gossip takes someone's sin, doesn't cover them. Gossip puts them on blast. Gossip, gossip puts them through a megaphone. What does Paul say about this? He says, if you're sinning in this way, you're just not busy enough. If you're sitting in this way, you're not busy enough. You're not working hard enough. You've become too comfortable in the life that you've carved out for yourself. Because if you were keeping yourself more busy at work, you wouldn't find time to gossip with other people. And your comfort has caused you to sin against the Lord and to sin against your fellow believers. Find something to do. Verses 11 through 13 here. 
For we hear that some of you walk, um, some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busy bodies. Such persons we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. As for you, brothers, do not grow weary in doing good. I want to read that again. We hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busy bodies. Such persons we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. But as for you, brothers, do not grow weary in doing good. Now, he uses the term here, busybody, which is kind of a play on words because a busybody is actually someone who is not very busy, right? That's why they're being a busybody. What, what were they doing in the Thessalonian church? They were interfering in people's lives. What did this look like, right? They may have gone around, we don't know exactly the nature of it. They may have gone around trying to convince people that they're in the day of the Lord, right? You're, you're experiencing God's wrath right now, so don't bother working. They may have tried to convince people that they had missed the rapture, okay? They may have just told people not to work. They might have just convinced people to be lazy, that there's no reason to be productive or to try to accomplish anything for Christ. They had just kind of discouraged people in that sense. What is it going to do to a church if that church is made up of busybodies? What is it going to do to a church long term if there's nothing but gossipers and busybodies and meddlers in the church? Eventually the church is not going to have any kind of ministry, right? Eventually there's not going to be any sense of fellowship. People will just hate each other. Look at 1 Peter 4, verses 14 through 16, please. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. If you suffer for the name of Christ, which if you're active for your faith, you're going to suffer for the name of Christ. You will face persecution for it. If you do that, you're blessed and the Lord is with you, he says. But don't suffer because you did something sinful. Don't suffer because you murdered someone. Don't suffer because you stole something from someone or because you meddled in someone's life. There's no blessing for you there. Suffer because you're a Christian. Suffer for the faith, not for any other reason. Proverbs 26, verse 17, puts it like this. Whoever meddles in a quarrel not his own is like one who takes a passing dog by the ears. <clears throat> I don't even want to take my own dog by the ears, much less you want to take a passing dog by the ears, right? Whoever meddles in a quarrel not his own is like one who takes a passing dog by the ears, like just let it go. I think the Bible really clearly highlights, highlights two of the most destructive effects of meddling. There are a lot of them, but I want to focus on two briefly here. Meddling, first of all, it destroys reputations. Meddling destroys reputations. If you've, if you've ever had someone meddle in your life, you've probably experienced this. It destroys reputations. Now, I think that some people do this intentionally. I think they meddle so that they can gain some personal information against someone and assassinate their character. But other people do it unintentionally, not realizing what they're doing and not realizing the risk of meddling in someone else's life. Deliberately or not, though, you could actually ruin someone's reputation by meddling in their lives. This just happened. And this is part of why Scripture warns us against this so strongly. Have a look with me. Proverbs 11, verses 12 and 13. Whoever belittles his neighbor lacks sense, but a man of understanding remains silent. Whoever goes about slandering reveals secrets, but he who is trustworthy in spirit keeps a thing covered. Whoever goes about slandering reveals secrets, but he who is trustworthy in spirit keeps a thing covered. Why are gossip and slander such a threat to someone's reputation? It's because of how easily they gain steam. The reality is that many people are so eager to receive gossip and they're so eager to pass it along because it gives them some kind of rush. It's like this secret little pleasure that they know is wrong, but it gives them a rush, right? And the fact is that many people want the bad things that they're hearing about other people to be true. They want them to be true. They want to believe the worst about other people. So it gains steam easily. And as long as the church has existed, gossip is something that church leaders have needed to confront. Because again, Christians have not really been better about this than the unsaved world. I want you to join me in the shortest book of the Bible, the book of 3 John. <clears throat> This entire book is only about 200 words in length. Shortest book of the Bible. Look with me at verses 9 and 10 here, please. 
I have written something to the church, but Diotrephes, who likes to put himself first, does not acknowledge our authority, so if I come, I'll bring up what he's doing, talking wicked nonsense against us. And not content with that, he refuses to welcome the brothers and also stops those who want to and puts them out of the church. Focus of the substance there. I'll bring up what he's doing, talking wicked nonsense against us, not acknowledging their authority. The Apostle John is one of the earliest leaders of the Christian church. This is in the first century. And, and some member of the congregation by the name of Diotrephes has been spreading lies about him and his ministry partners. Throughout all of his letters, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, what is John trying to do the most? He's trying to unite people in love. He's trying to point them to the truth of the gospel. He's trying to point them to the truth of Jesus. This Diotrephes fellow is doing the opposite of that. He's trying to tear down the ministry. He's trying to tear down people's reputations. He doesn't want to see them unified. Here's the second thing. Meddling destroys relationships. It destroys relationships. It destroys reputations, and it destroys relationships. Not only will it destroy the relationship between you and the person you're meddling against, but it can destroy that person's relationships with other people. Just by spreading a rumor, you could tear down someone's reputation and their most meaningful relationships. Look at me at Proverbs 6, verse 28 here, please. <clears throat> a dishonest man spreads strife and a whisperer separates close friends. A dishonest man spreads strife, and a whisperer separates close friends. A whisperer is a gossip, right? Someone who passes around stories that can very easily damage friendships, destroy ministries, turn people against each other. Now, lots of times I think this happens unintentionally, but other times I think it's done on purpose. They want to destroy relationships. Turn with me to Proverbs 26 there, verses 20 through 22. For lack of wood, a fire goes out, and where there is no whisperer, there's that word again, quarreling ceases. As charcoal to hot embers and wood to fire, so is a quarrelsome man for kindling strife. The words of a whisperer are like delicious morsels. They go down into the inner parts of the body. Why is there quarreling? Be many times there's quarreling because you have people whispering, you have people creating conflict, you have people stirring up strife. They take minor disagreements, they turn them into major disagreements. They keep things going, right? If you have a fire and you stop adding fuel to it, what's it going to do? It's going to die out eventually. If you keep adding wood to a fire, it keeps going, it gets bigger. Same thing happens with conflict. If you have someone actively feeding it, actively stoking it, it gets worse and worse and worse. Here's the final thing from the passage. Believers must not condone unbiblical behavior from other believers. Believers must not condone unbiblical behavior from other believers. <clears throat> Paul concludes this thought, and we'll bring this to a close here. He re-emphasizes that if anyone doesn't obey the instructions in this letter, at this point, this person is being really, really stubborn. They're being really obstinate. He taught them these things when he was with them in Thessalonica. He wrote these things to them in 1 Thessalonians, and now he's written it again. And, I, and, and now it's time for discipline. And I see this in my own life, too. If I have to tell my kid once to do something, no big deal. If I have to tell him twice to do something, all right, now it's a bigger deal. If I've got to tell him three times to do something, now we've got a serious problem. Now there's going to be discipline. And I realize that I do this not because it brings me joy to discipline them, but because I want what's best for them. God's the same way with us. How stubborn are we oftentimes to what we know God is commanding us to do and many times he's commanded us over and over and over to do it, and we can't bring ourselves to obey. And that's where these individuals are in the Thessalonian church. They've had multiple chances to repent, and they've persisted in this pattern of sin. Now, what responsibility do other Christians have to this unrepentant believer? What responsibility? The main responsibility is to not condone their behavior. It's to not condone their behavior. Now, everything we've seen in 1 and 2 Thessalonians says that this was not a church-wide issue. It's not like the entire church was engaging in this, and so the entire church is being corrected for it. It appears that this is just a few individuals, maybe just a few families who are being lazy, and everyone else in the church is kind of watching it happen, but they're not necessarily joining in. I think if everyone in the church were messing up this way, then the language in the letters would have been a lot different and he wouldn't have complimented them over and over and over again as he has to this point, right? This is just a few people. I want us to look at verses 14 and 15 here. 
If anyone does not obey what we say in this letter, take note of that person and have nothing to do with him, that he may be ashamed. Do not regard him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. Do not regard him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. We often think of church discipline as being between a church member and the church elders, right? Like it doesn't involve the whole church, it doesn't need to involve them. And many times that's the case. But he's giving instructions here to the whole church. He's not just giving instructions to church leadership. He's giving instructions to the whole church. Now we talked last week about the relationship between Matthew 18 and this passage. You remember that our Lord Jesus gives us four steps to follow in church discipline. And the fourth step is treat this person like an unbeliever. Treat this person like a, a tax collector and a heathen. Paul is saying to the Thessalonians here, you're at step three. These people are persisting in an unrepentant sin. You're at step three. You need to identify them, you need to warn them, and then you need to actually avoid them. You need to withdraw fellowship from them. You need to draw back from them. Have nothing to do with them. Why would we take such a drastic step in response to this? It's in the hopes that it will bring them to repentance. Like it's this last ditch effort to bring them back to repentance, to make them feel the heat. And then after they repent, the goal is to have them restored to fellowship. The goal of church discipline is always done to bring the person back into the fold. That's always the intention of it. This is why he says here in verse 15, do not regard him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. You're still treating this person like they're saved. You're not treating them like a pagan or a tax collector or a false teacher or a false prophet or a heretic. You're still treating them like a fellow Christian. This is what he wants, right? And you're not questioning their salvation. You're basically treating them like a wayward member of the family. If they resist even that, and they persist in their sins, and we don't know how it worked out for this group of people in the church, we don't hear, we don't hear about this ever again, if they continue in their sin, then it would be a different story. <clears throat> and this is where this teaching concludes, right? If we're not working hard, if we're not being productive, if we're meddling in other people's lives, the Bible says we should expect to be disciplined for it. We should expect to be shunned. We should expect to have fellowship withdrawn from us for it. I'll leave you with this word in 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 7 and 8. For God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. Therefore, whoever disregards this, disregards not man, but God, who gives his Holy Spirit to you. God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. Therefore, whoever disregards this, disregards not man, but God, who gives his Holy Spirit to you. Let's close with prayer. Father, we love you. We thank you again for your continued clear instruction in this passage of Scripture. Help us to be Christians who are productive for your kingdom. Help us not to waste time or energy sinning by meddling in other people's lives or passing along gossip or rejoicing to hear gossip or being involved in it in any way. We see the dangers of this, Lord, because you've warned us over and over again. Lord, if there are any here who aren't conforming to the teaching of your word, please convict them. Please bring them to obedience. We thank you for the fellowship that's here this morning. Please equip us by the help of your Holy Spirit to put your words into practice this week. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you please stand as we close in song?
going to lead you in the benediction right now, but please don't leave after that. I have one really, really important announcement. I'll just need two or three minutes of your time. Benediction is from number six. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. So they shall put my name upon the people of Israel, and I will bless them. Uh, if you looked at the bulletin this morning, specifically the back of it, it looks like we went backwards in money last week. You might say, how is that possible? Like, how do we have less money this week than we did last week? Uh, we did not go backwards, but here's what happened. For a few years, you can be seated. <laughs> For a number of years now, our church has hosted two uh, groups from Cattaraugus County that rent out our building from us. We have SWAN, which stands for Senior Wellness and Nutrition. They're a Meals on Wheels program that use our church's basement Monday through Friday from the early morning uh, to about the mid-afternoon. 